Um, I'm Nate Boyd. I'm a professional engineer, uh, ASHRAE certified commissioning process management professional in Elite AP. Um, I've uh, graduated here in Orlando, the University of Central Florida, go Knights. Uh, I've got over 19 years experience in building automation and controls. I grew up in the industry. My dad's family business down in Southwest Florida it was a building automation and controls contractor. So I learned from a very early age, um, you know, pulling wires, mounting sensors, wiring up controllers, programming controllers can get me out of my, my, ha you know, my mom's hair during summer vacations. So I've been in and around controls my entire life. And um, I served as the energy manager for the city of Orlando for a number of years prior to coming on board at Hanson. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Daniels. I'm the assistant director for maintenance operations at the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority. It's a separate authority that runs the Orlando International Airport, where many of you probably flew in on or flew in at. We also take care of a small general aviation airport uh, just to the north of the big airport. Um, I've been chasing accreditations for a long time. I've got a bunch. I won't list them all off, but I am a certified state uh, mechanical contractor and a certified energy manager, auditor, and a few other things. I've been in this business for 35 years, thereabouts. Um, been doing a lot of work on energy and a lot of work on facilities. So w what brought us to Hanson, or what brought us to the idea of doing an energy roadmap? Uh, is we had a couple things going. We wrote a new sustainability management plan, uh, which identified a savings of 10% off of our energy use uh, index. At the same time, we were growing in record numbers uh, for passengers traveling in and out of the airport. At the same time, we were designing and getting ready, to, I think we're getting ready to build the intermodal transportation facility, new train stations, about a million square feet of a new facility. And at the same time, we're expanding the land side and our air side four, so another 300,000 square feet of facility that we're building and adding two new central energy plants. We just didn't know what the future looked like. So we needed to know a couple things. How do we continue to shave energy cost while growing at 10% a year? And how to do that while growing in square footage and uh, capacity for chill water? So we came to Hanson for, for just that, to come up with an energy plan and to do some audits to help us out. Essentially, the energy roadmap, it begins with the end in mind. We knew what the goal was. The goal was a 10% energy savings reduction across the entire portfolio of a pretty massive portfolio of properties. We'll, we'll get into a little bit of the, the, the numbers here very shortly. But essentially, it starts off with a 10,000 foot view perspective of where all the energy and utilities are being consumed in the entire portfolio. Um, which facility, you know, where, where, where is the highest EUI, I mean, a bunch of other normalization factors, but essentially helped kind of lay out a prioritization sequence of where we really, really needed to start looking first throughout the airport. And it's a solid, repeatable, stepwise approach. For any of you that sat in on the ISO 50001 meeting this morning, very similar process, development, develop a plan and, and continuous improvement and tracking of that plan and, and, and verification that you're actually achieving the targets that are set forth. And it's, like I said, it's a stepwise procedure. And <clears throat> one of the, the key highlights that we want to bring up in this presentation is the difference between implementing an internal energy management program like an energy roadmap versus outsourcing that to a performance contractor like an ESCO. And a lot of instances where you're a cash strapped organization, it makes sense to, to outsource the capital expenditures for large chiller replacements and stuff like that. But when you look at the entire portfolio of everything that you've got from a, you know, taking a step back and looking at it from a holistic point of view, there's a lot of interactive effects on a lot of the different projects and, and energy conservation measures that you can implement that aren't effectively captured very well in the performance contracting um, methods. So this tool is, kind of sits above any specific contracts with performance contractors in those instances, and we want to kind of call those out where they come up. And this is intended to be a living document. It's designed to be a, a repeated approach. As targets are achieved, as projects get implemented, as MNV results are coming in, go back through, look and see what's worked, where is it falling short, if it's falling short anywhere, where do we need to make up any gaps, what needs to be done next, and, and repeat the cycle over again for continuous improvement. So the scope of the work for the energy roadmap for for MCO, as we call it, the Orlando International Airport, 
involved energy forecasts involving the existing facilities and all the new planned construction that was coming down the pipeline, a significant amount of construction, and energy analysis of the existing assets, like I said, which is essentially benchmarking what they've got, uh, conducting energy audits, um, <clears throat> developing retro commissioning plans for moving forward with the incumbent building automation contractor there on site, a deep dive analysis of the building automation and energy management systems, as well as integration language with the overall sustainability master plan of the airport itself. So on the energy forecasting side, we sat down and we conducted interviews and had meetings with the utility provider, or Orlando Utilities Commission in this particular case, who provides power and water to the site. Um, TECO provides natural gas, but it's not used by any of the airport's infrastructure themselves. Some tenants use natural gas, but that was outside of the scope of what we were specifically there to look at within the, the framework of what the airport wanted to achieve. So the information that we got out of the OUC, and, and we asked them 5, 10, 15 year scenarios on, on any, any impacts with permanent generation that they were planning, um, substation replacements, transmission line replacements, what kind of, what kind of tariffs, you know, um, ratcheting rates were they expecting to see over, over that time frame. And essentially they gave us guidance to go ahead and anticipate a 2.5% annual escalation beyond 2016. And something that hadn't been disclosed to us previous to that meeting is that they were going to implement a 5% increase in the cost of water um, in 2016. Which, did, which was implemented, and prior to that meeting, that hadn't been announced yet, so the airport was unaware that that added cost was coming their direction. And, and the water bill's a pretty substantial component of, of everything that they've got out there. Um, we also took a look at the legislation that affects the utilities as well. When, when this report was conducted, or this assessment, I should say, the EPA Clean Power Plan had recently um, been been put forth and the Florida Public Service Commission was assessing the impacts of that. The Orlando Utilities Commission was also doing their own assessment of what kind of impact that would have on their tariff structures. Um, we also were looking at two different competing um, language solar ballots in Florida as well that, that one could have potentially negative ramifications on the airport, the other one potentially positive. Fortunately, the positive one passed, the negative one did not. Uh, Though they, they really tried. Um, we also you know, looked at the security concerns regarding the utility infrastructure. You know, the Orlando International Airport sees a significant amount of passenger traffic through it and a lot of VIP traffic through it as well. So we wanted to take a look at the standby power generation capacity um, and as well as where the substation feeders were coming in and, and were there any, you know, aside from, from Florida just being a, basically a target sticking out in the Atlantic Ocean for hurricanes, we also take into consideration that we, we live in tumultuous times, so there's a human element to, to taking a look at risk factors like utility feeds as well. So we, we also took a look at that. Um, and then we also assessed what the, the current rebate and incentive structures were available from the utilities and where they were planning on going with their rebate and incentive programs so that we could factor those into future energy projects at the airport. So a quick analysis of, of the overall portfolio of, of, of buildings, and there's a lot of buildings out at the airport. Um, overall, their, their portfolio is, is roughly about a million and a half dollars a year in consumption charges alone, and a further $3 million a year in demand. Their peak summer demand is about 52 megawatts. It's a pretty substantial load. It's a big site. Um, it, was, it was comparable to the por size of the portfolio that I had for all 770 buildings under my control at the city of Orlando. Um, so, as you can see in, the, in this graph right here, I mean, the text is a little dark, I apologize for that, but the land side terminal where everybody shows up, you know, and you go through ticketing and, and TSA and everything, as you would imagine, that's the lion's share of the current power consumption out there at the airport, about 54% of it in total. So, the airport has, uh, well, let's just say, a significant amount of, of buildings that don't fit cleanly into the CBEX database. For those of you unfamiliar with that, Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey. It's what Energy Star is based off of. It's, it's part of what ASHRAE Standard 100 is built off of. Um, well, airport terminals don't fit cleanly into any of those building use types. They're actually lumped into the same building category as bus stations. So if you put an airport terminal into Portfolio Manager or Building EQ or something like that, you get a, well, a, a useless number, let's just say. It, it doesn't provide any value to the owner whatsoever. So 
really, we, we took a refined approach to that, and it was also difficult to use historic energy usage uh, for baselines because the airport is under construction forever, essentially. Um, so you, there's a lot of different factors that come into play, but, but essentially through this process, we were able to benchmark about 85% of the total proper, uh, buildings on campus there. Um, fuel depot stations and stuff like that, there, there's, just, there's just certain things that, that are just gonna have to be treated in, as a unique case use. Um, but, you know, bearing in mind an overall 10% reduction was the target, that means they, they ideally want to save about a million and a half dollars a year off their utility bills. Um, and they have a five-year payback criteria associated with any energy savings project. Um, so, like I said, there's a significant amount of new construction that's going on. Uh, for any of you that, that did fly into MCO or traveled up through the south side of the airport whatsoever, that massive amount of construction down there, we colloquially know, call the South Airport Complex. It's a, a whole number of, of different facilities. They're all comprised in it. But in talking with OUC and, and discussing with the, the design consultants on those projects, the anticipated feeder schedules from the utility, you know, utility transformers and stuff like that, and taking into a load factor analysis where the existing buildings are performing, where we're expecting the new ones to be able to perform. We anticipate that um, roughly 56 million kilowatt hours will be added to the overall consumption of the airport portfolio if everything was, was just looked at as at a snapshot in time where this was, and could also add an additional potential 9.3 megawatts of peak demand. So the whole South Airport complex could potentially add up to a four and a half million dollars in additional utility costs per year that the airport will need to budget for. So, in going through and, and you know, benchmarking all the facilities and identifying which ones really need to be pri prioritized for energy audits, the, even though the land side terminal is by far the lion's share, it's also by far the lion's share of square footage as well with a lot of intricate systems associated with it. And the air side terminals one, two, and three were actually ideal candidates to get a better snapshot of, of more of the overall systems that that were found throughout the entire airport. We didn't audit Airside 4 because it was going, it was getting a new central energy plan, it was getting about 40 air handlers replaced. There were a lot of, lot of projects concurrent in Airside 4. So we did ASHRAE level one energy audits of Airside terminals one, two, and three, roughly about a million square foot of conditions and active space. Um, and we identified 52 energy conservation measures and facility improvement measures during that process. Now we started with an ASHRAE level one because it's, it, it makes sense to, it, when, you're, when you're tackling something this large, to use a triaged approach. You don't wanna throw a level two effort or a level three effort at something this massive until you've kind of scaled down and, and zeroed in on exactly which energy conservation measures you really want to invest the time and energy and effort into understanding more of. A lot of this stuff is low hanging fruit that's tied up in the controls and, and environment, so it doesn't really need that extra level of, of uh, analysis. So we started with a level one, um, and then we also developed a measurement and verification um, outline, if you will, not a full plan, but an outline of what the MNV plan should look like in order to capture the energy savings of the ECMs that we did recommend. Um, and we also, um, one of the things that, that was identified as, as kind of out there still coming as a future energy related project for study later on down the line is a photovoltaic study of the north parking lot. That there seems to be a significant potential there and the airport is currently working with OUC to, to move forward with feasibility analysis and feasibility study of that. Um, but you know, was, during the, the conducting of these energy audits, we kept in, in back of mind um, some persistent strategies. Where, where, where would we be able to apply the information that we learned during the energy audits from these air sides across the other facilities so we don't need to du duplicate efforts? You can just take what, what already has been identified here and apply it broadly across the rest of the portfolio. Um, where does it make sense to go ahead and implement a retro commissioning routine? Where do you already have the building automation infrastructure in place and, and, and stuff like that? And as well as future down the line, enterprise um, metering systems and fault detection and diagnostics of that control system, bearing in mind the um, extreme security vetting that the airport <laughs> would like to protect their building automation and control systems with. And they don't want outside access into this, so pushing data to the cloud is, is not really an option, at least not with um, you know, current, current 
schemes, we'll, we'll, we'll just say. So as part of the level one energy audit, and you know, this, this kind of draws from my, my background in building automation and controls, we spent a lot of time and effort doing a deep dive into the control systems themselves, but not just from a controllability of systems and from sequence of operations and, and looking at the parameters and stuff. That's, that's stuff that we all do during any energy audit. We took a very close look at the, um, the graphical user interface of the controls front end as well. Are they really maximizing the benefit of that control system? And is, does it have all of the information in there that really ought to be in a one-stop shop that your control system could be? So things like equipment nameplate data, you know, make, model, serial number, refrigerant charge, amp draw, that type of stuff that you see on the equipment that could be on the equipment graphics as well. So a, a new service tech coming on board doesn't need to go and hunt and try to find that information anywhere. Um, same thing with factory service manuals, bill of materials, and as-built documents. These are all suggestions um, to be you know, rolled in and implemented into the, the building automation system. Um, and out of the 52 ECMs that we identified during the energy audits, uh, the majority of those were programming or parametric changes within the control system itself. Uh, a lot of this stuff is, is essentially no cost. Um, one of them in particular, we, th there's a three-story annex office building there located on campus, which um, uh, in the overall portfolio of buildings is, is small in the amount of energy it uses, but its energy cost and its energy usage per square foot was was significantly higher than it ought to have been. So we went in there and we took a look, and it was having thermal comfort control you know, issues as well. It's where the badging office is, so if you go in and get your security badging done, so anybody that's gone through that process, that room that you sit in in the morning and you used to bake during the sun in there, we've, we've fixed that problem now. What we realized is that there was roughly about 16,000 CFM being dumped into the, the um, unoccupied zones in the, in the middle of the building, so, you know, in, the sun rose in the morning, all the temperature and reset routines were in the controls were shot by, by 9 a.m. because of all the heat gain coming in through the windows. And then in the afternoon, it would switch over to the other side. So we, um, in conjunction with the, the controls contractor, installed occupancy sensors in those middle spaces and reduced the unoccupied CFMs to zero, relieving that all that... Um, overcooling of the interior spaces and allow that extra air to then go to those perimeter zones and solve a lot of those problems. And it cut, what was it, $30,000 that first year yep. in power? $30,000 30, on, a, on a practically no cost ECM. A couple hours of the, the controls contractor time and a handful of occupancy sensors. So it's just that, that, that deep understanding of, of how these control systems are interacting and what types of effects is, is really the, the focus, in my mind, of where most of the in level one energy audit efforts need to be applied. So, like I said, we then racked and stacked the energy conservation measures into, into different groups, HVAC, lighting, plug-in process, envelope, data management. Data management is key, looking future down the line for, for implementing fault detection and diagnostics. Um, and we looked at, at this through a holistic approach, not just you know, easy to calculate energy conservation measures, but what are the interactive effects, which projects make logical sense to be implemented and in what order. So, um, so the, the energy conservation measures, like I said, they were kind of bundled into, into logical project progressions and the, um, and the operations and maintenance staff and control staff have been working down that list. and. Um, Jeff, I believe that you, you've already achieved your 10% energy savings target over a, a year in advance, right? We have. Uh, overall, over, here we go. O overall, we've achieved uh, right at 10%. Um, but in that facility that you're talking about, the three-story annex building, uh, we brought our EUI, our Energy Star score, from in the teens to a 59, I think it is now. So a significant uh, difference. Um, so, so the next thing we're trying to do now is we're actually, we've already uh, started our lead for existing buildings program. So those scores are going to be so important to this uh, next, next year or so, uh, so we can get those buildings online. So I mean, normally here at this slide, I go through the process of talking about retro commissioning, but in, with this particular audience and, and bearing in mind that the bar is, is you know, waiting right after us, 
you know, we, we, we understand that you have the body of knowledge to understand the steps that go into the retro commissioning process. We're not going to expand a lot into that. But what, what, we, what I do want to say about this is that we helped put together the, the framework for a formal retro commissioning plan that builds off of the annual point-to-point -point checkout that the controls vendor already does through the you know, hundreds of thousands of building automation points that are, that are on the Almost 500,000 500, points in the control system at, at, at MCO. It's, it's a substantial lift. So um, some persistent strategies moving forward that were also identified within the energy roadmap. And a lot of this the airport has already implemented, so this just kind of formalized it within a, a structured document, was the continuously updated design standards, which the airport is implementing on the South Airport Complex series of, of projects, as well as the renovations to the north, um, to the north campus. Um, facilities and full project commissioning, which is which has now been implemented on a handful of the facilities that that are already that have gone through pre-design design and are, now are in construction phase um, south of the airport. Um, continue to benchmark the rest of the facilities. Um, there's there are some um, ACRP Airport Cooperative Research Program methodologies that have been developed since this. Um, roadmap was, was implemented to benchmark those harder to benchmark airport style facilities um, and continue to, to implement energy use tracking, particularly onboarding that information into the control systems. So uh, as another part of this is, you know, the airport it does a, a fantastic job at with their sustainability programs. So getting that information out to the 66 million visitors that roll through the airport or, or 42 million, 60, uh, it's, Tens of millions of people that roll through the airport and jumble in numbers. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's it's all part of the public awareness and education campaign. You know, you're doing good job, you know, doing a good job, doing you know, making significant progress in sustainability. You want to champion that, um, and then eventually roll into um, fault detection and diagnostics, and continue to onboard that building documentation into the building automation system. So it's a one-stop shop for O and M. Now. Operator training is on here. Actually, that really needs to be moved to the top of the list because in, in, any, in any energy audit, that ought to be energy conservation measure number one, is implement continuous and evolving operator training on the systems and the technology that you have in the, in the buildings because that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's the boots on the ground guys that are working on this stuff every single day and if you're implementing new technology in there or new controls routines and you haven't brought them up to speed on it, you're throwing good money after bad. They're just going to put things right back to, the, to the where that they were because they haven't been instructed otherwise. And it stops the phone from ringing. And it stops the phone from ringing. Yep. Um, and, like I said, continue to, to implement a formal retro commissioning process. We still have quite a bit of our property portfolio that we have not even looked at. We mentioned the air side four and the land side, and that makes up for four and a half million square feet that we still haven't done an audit on. So that's coming up uh, in probably two years when we finish our construction project. Uh, we're going to continue to implement all of the ECMs that have been identified, at least all that we can. Not all of them will be implemented, but most of them. Most of them already have. All the control stuff has already been taken care of. Uh, we have about 90 air handlers being replaced, getting rid of 95% or higher of our pneumatic uh, controls. So we'll be DDC almost 100%. I think we'll have three air handlers left when we're done with this next couple of projects. Um, we're, we continue to redefine and rethink and re-engineer our sustainability management plan. So we're going to be continuing to look at more opportunities to save energy, save water. Um, we see that the energy increases have not come to fruition. In fact, we had a decrease last year, so that was a little bit of a sigh of relief. Unfortunately, the water is going to cause us a lot of problems. In Florida, we're getting some salination in the water, and so our hardness is going up. So that's going to cause some issues on both sides, not only in the water usage, but also on the uh, energy side. So we're looking at um, how to better do our cooling towers, better um, equip our cooling towers for that, uh, for that, um, that challenge. We already are and will continue to engage our business partners. So it's not just GOA, it's not just the authority, it's also the airlines, the rental cars, 
uh, all the concessions, and they're all on board. Our green team is over 100 people now, and, and that includes all of those folks. We also have consultants. We have um, city and county employees that are part of our green team. So it's a, it's a big issue here. We're, the airport's a, a big footprint in, in the community uh, because it serves so many people. And the number is actually 42 million right now. We expect to be at 44 by the end of the year, and that's 22 million people in, 22 million people out every year. Um, it's a significant population in that place. Um, so we've got some commissioning, uh, retro commissioning. Uh, we've not done well at commissioning. I'll just air the dirty laundry in the past. So we won't be doing any recommissioning since we've never done it in the first place. So we're looking at retro commissioning some of these other areas that we're looking to take through the lead for EBOM. Um, and all the new facilities are being commissioned as new construction. And so uh, I mentioned the intermo intermodal transportation facility. We're also in design, and it's hit the news already, for a new terminal, Terminal C. Uh, and that'll bring us into a whole new world there uh, in the south. That'll be about a million square feet when they open it up, and it will continue. That'll be one-sixth of what, they, what the final build-out will be. I think that's it. Yeah. So like I said, we continue with public outreach. So we were doing signage throughout the airport now. We're doing signage throughout some of the smaller buildings. We have three fire stations on site and we'll be doing all the way down to there. Even for the firemen, they'll know what we're doing in sustainability and for energy and water reduction. Um, I think that's about it. Green, green Building Labels Awards and Recognition. I just mentioned that we're going through a lead process for new construction and for existing buildings. Um, we expect to have our first facility certified um, probably by the next uh, six months, eight months, at least that get it all registered. And that'll be one of our fire, fire stations. We chose that one because it was the first one that actually met the energy requirements for the ENA for LEED. And so that is the other big push to get the rest of these buildings in line. So for those of you that have um, airports as, as clients, the energy management planning or, or you know, energy roadmaps and the implementation of those projects are now federal, federally eligible for AIP grants and for PFC participation. Um, so th that means that you, you can now tap into that funding source that was otherwise util previously earmarked only for capital projects. Um, what we tend to find is that energy impacts due to asset degradation, entropy, if you wish to call it, averages between 4 and 8% each year after the initial building startup. Um, so, you know, as many of you know through the retro commissioning process, that, that tends to have anywhere, I mean, it could, be, it could be an immediate payback depending upon what you find, but we, we tend to find stuff that doesn't, most retro commissioning projects don't don't run past an 18-month payback. They, they tend to find a significant amount of energy savings, um, and those savings could be anywhere between 5 and 30%. I, I had one of them at the city of Orlando. We had a 60% energy reduction at one particular facility through a retro-commissioning effort. Um, so essentially, the energy management, master energy management approach or energy roadmap approach is, is intended to be to look at things through the long-term lens of, the, of the, the goals of the organization, but also intermediate and short-term steps in order to achieve that. And the, the greatest benefit of it is it really starts to move the organization away from a reactive mode into a planned or proactive mode when it comes to maintenance and energy savings projects, um, which, which ultimately has a lower maintenance cost per square foot factor associated with it. Um, there's plenty of public, um, you know, plenty of publications out there describing the, the general uh, maintenance cost savings associated with moving out of a reactive mode into a planned maintenance mode. Um, so the other thing about the energy roadmap is it, it establishes an energy project pipeline. So you know they're, they're clearly established and they're complementary in nature, which allows them to be um, digested more easily at that C-suite level. There's a solid continuous plan here that's logical and makes sense and can be repeated and moved through. Um, so our, our experience, um, you know, our, our analytics has been shown to reduce utility and maintenance costs between 5 and 20% annually. 
Um, and you know, even though this said will exceed 10%, like I said, they've, they've already exceeded that 10% target, just going down the list of the controls related ECMs and the other projects that they were already implementing there at the airport.